Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Rebecca, otherwise known as Hip Knit Hooray Online. And today I'm bringing to you my second knitting podcast. I wanted to first say a huge thank you to everybody uh, for your response on my first two videos. I am, I, I'm blown away by the response. I was not expecting that at all when I had posted those videos, but I'm so excited for what's to come on this channel. I'm really happy to create all of this content and I'm so glad that some of you want to stick around. Uh, I had filmed my second video, so my fall knitting plans, super close to my podcast just a few days later. And so I hadn't posted any videos yet, and that's why I never acknowledged it in that, that video. But I just wanted to say a huge, huge thank you. And I think um, once I reach a thousand subscribers, which I don't know when, and I, I don't want to put too much pressure on it, but when I do, I'm thinking I'll host a little bit of a Q&A so you can get to know me better and ask any questions that you have of me. Um, so I think I had mentioned in my first podcast that I am going to film these monthly. And so what I had thought was I was going to call them like my September podcast, my October podcast, my November podcast, but I really don't want to hold myself to that because I want to make sure that I have enough content or just uh, progress on my knits to share. So I do want to try to do them monthly, but I'll just stick to numbering them. So this is the second podcast. And I guess we can just jump into finished objects. So I have two this month that I want to share. The first one is one that I already shared on my first podcast. It was a whip and it is the camisole number nine by My Favorite Things Knitwear. So I guess I I keep showing the front and the back. I don't know if it's helpful, but I just will because it's it's a tank, so it does look a little bit different on the back. So this is the front, and then the back has the higher um, hem, I guess I would say. So this camisole I knit with two yarns. I knit the main part of the body with a Premier Wool Free Sock Yarn, which is a majority acrylic yarn. I think it's 93% acrylic, 7% PBT, which is elastic. And I had chosen that yarn because A, I already had it in stash, and B, I thought the elastic would be very helpful for a project like this, which has negative ease. And so far it's been really great. It's, um, like I said, it is acrylic, so it may not be the best for summer garments compared to more natural fibers like a cotton or cotton merino. Um, it's been pretty comfortable uh, so far, but it is October, so it isn't super hot when I've been wearing this camisole. So we'll see, maybe I'll do a little bit of a report back. And so I knit the main body with Premier Wool Free Sock Yarn, and then I knew I didn't have enough yarn, so I also use Knitting for Olive Merino uh, in the shade, I think Red Current. So what I did is, I think in the last podcast, I had already knit the neckline and also the um, armholes. So I did the folded over hem for that. But for the bottom, I decided to do a slight modification from the pattern. And I did one by one um, ribbing with the Knitting for Olive Merino, just because based off of the way that I had done the hem so far, uh, especially for the armholes, it really cinched in the fabric. And so I was worried about how it was going to fit around my waist because the camisole is a little bit cropped. Uh, so I just decided to do the one by one hem because it's a little bit more stretchy. And I was worried that it was going to look uh, like it wasn't going to match, but I kind of like how it looks. I think you really don't notice it too, too much. Uh, yeah, I'm happy with that modification. Um, what else can I say about, about the pattern? I feel like, uh, like all my favorite things, knitwear patterns, I like how they're formatted. They're very clear uh, with just enough details. So I enjoyed the knitting experience uh, in terms of how to read the pattern. But I think if I were to knit it again, I might not do the folded over hems like the way it is written in the pattern. So the way that you knit the hems are you... Uh, pick up stitches, so for both the neckline and the arm hole, you pick up the stitches and then you knit uh, in stockinette and then you cast off and then you fold the hem down and sew it. 
and I really don't enjoy that. I don't enjoy uh, sewing it down, especially with uh, such a fine gauge project like this because it took a really long time and it just looks very unfinished on the inside, at least the way that I did it. So when I had first seen this pattern, what I thought this uh, braided detail was, uh, I thought it was, I think it's called an Estonian braid or a lateral braid, and I thought it was knit onto the um, hems, and then you fold over uh, the hem once you've knit it, which it is not. <laughs> And so I think if I were to knit this camisole again, and I, I'm not going to recommend it to anybody who hasn't uh, knit the project yet because I don't know if it works, but I would want to try that. I would want to pick up stitches and then try doing that Estonian braid. I think I would just pick up the stitches and then try and do that braid and then uh, knit the hem and then just knit it down because I think it's a lot cleaner. Uh, and other than that, I think it's a great summer knit project. Uh, it's knit on a finer gauge on three millimeter needles, which I've come to really enjoy for, for summer projects. I think that that creates a thinner fabric and it's more comfortable and it just has such a classic um, and simple silhouette. So that is the first finished object. The second one is one that hasn't made an appearance on this channel because it was a super quick knit. It was also a test knit, so I did have a little bit of a shorter deadline to knit this piece. And it is the Aspen Sweater by Ula Knitwear. So I've just finished casting this off, uh, so I need to uh, sew the hems down, but maybe I'll just get into what the piece is. Uh, the Aspen sweater is a top-down raglan um, knit in a very thick, chunky gauge with very dramatic sleeves. So, uh, with this pattern, I use... Actually, let me pull, pull out the yarn. I'm able to show the yarn even though I finished the project because I have a ton of leftovers. Um, the yarn was sponsored and gifted by Ulan Knitwear and Asagar Yarn. I have never used Asagar before. Uh, I've seen it at my local yarn store but just never had the opportunity to try it so I'm, I'm so thankful that uh, the yarn was provided for the test. I used one strand of Jensen which is 100% wool and I would say like a light DK weight. And then Tvini, which is a light fingering weight. Also, I, it just feels like Jensen at a thinner gauge. So I think it's the same type of wool that's used. Uh, and then also uh, silk mohair. So I held one strand of each uh, to knit the garment. So three strands together. And um, it's knit on eight millimeter needles. And it creates this really light and airy fabric. It's not see-through, but it is super lightweight. It's not um, dense at all, so I think it creates a really nice drape. I know in the pattern there's multiple yarn alternatives. Uh, many testers use a different combination, so I think it's really great um, if you just want to experiment with different combinations of yarn. There's a lot of options uh, in the pattern. So I haven't knit a pattern or a raglan sweater like this in quite a while and it was super enjoyable um, because everything is knit seamlessly. I've knit a lot of um, drop shoulder sweaters in the past year and with those types of sweaters you typically will knit the back, then you break the yarn, then you knit the front pieces, then you break the yarn, then you do the collar. Um, and so with this one, it was super enjoyable because you first start off by doing the double folded collar, which is always super squishy. Then you go straight into the raglan shaping. So this pattern doesn't feature any short rows. Uh, the front and the back look identical. When I've tried it on though, I didn't get uh, a lot of that bunching that happens when you don't do short rows. I think because the neck is a little bit wider, uh, but there is no short row shaping in this, this sweater. So you do uh, the raglan stitch and it's a little bit wider. It's three stitches wide. And so you knit uh, the raglan until you reach the separation between the sleeve and the body. This pattern is knit 
very different than any other raglan sweater I've knit before in that you knit the sleeves first before the body. So at least all the raglan sweaters that I've knit in the past, you work the raglan stitches and then when you're ready to separate, you cast on stitches for the body and then you knit the body um, in the round. And then after that, you pick up the sleeve stitches that you put on hold and then you pick up some of the stitches along the cast on edge here for the rest of the sleeve to connect it in the round. With this sweater though, you knit the raglan and then when you're ready to separate for the body and the sleeve, you put one uh, sleeve and all the body stitches on hold and then you cast on stitches for the sleeve. Uh, then you knit that sleeve and there are no decreases which creates a very dramatic sleeve. Uh, so once you finish that sleeve, then you pick up stitches for the second sleeve, then you cast on stitches, then you knit that sleeve in the round and then after you finish that second sleeve, you pick up the front part of the sweater, then you cast on stitches along the side, then you pick up the back stitches, and then the stitches along the other sleeve side, and then you knit that in the round. So it is the same way as a raglan sweater that I have knit in the past, but I, it just took some uh, thinking for me to figure out how this should be constructed. It's just a backwards, uh, way of doing the other sweaters I have in the past, but I had a little bit of trouble trying to visualize it. The sweater pattern also doesn't have a ton of detail, which personally I liked because I've knit quite a few sweaters before, so I like the very no-nonsense way that it was written, but compared to other sweaters that are tailored for beginners, I'm thinking like the Semper sweater by Sophia of the Knit Purple, which really goes into the details of how to do each technique, what yarns you should be using. I think that pattern has a yarn guide. Uh, this pattern has less details. So if you do want just a really simple, classic raglan oversized sweater, then go for this pattern, but if you need more of that detail uh, and instruction, then I would say maybe not this pattern. And I almost forgot to mention my favorite design feature of the sweater. So at the edge of the sleeves, and I think I'm gonna start doing this more for my knits because I actually really enjoy the look. It's super dramatic. Um, I just think it looks really refined and finished. You have a folded over uh, hem for the sleeve. So like I said, there's no decreases worked in the sleeves, which creates this very dramatic um, sleeve edge. And you knit the one by one rib for the sleeve and then you fold it down. And I still have to do this for mine, um, but I will shortly after this video, is you fold over the hem and then you sew it down along the sleeve edge. And I just think the folded over hem adds a really nice refined design detail and it makes the sleeve extra super squishy. So I started this, I think I had received the yarn maybe a week after I had filmed my podcast and then I had knit it in three weeks. So a super, super fast knit um, and I haven't had one of these projects in so long, so I really enjoyed the, the very simple and meditative knit process. And those were my two finished objects for this podcast. I feel like they were on two very different extremes. Uh, one fingering weight summer tank on three millimeter needles and one chunky, uh, thicker raglan sweater on eight millimeter needles, but I enjoy both of them equally nonetheless, and I'm happy to have both of those done. So I think I will move on to my whips uh, and I forgot one of my whips. Let me let me grab it. All right, I'm back. And I wanted to give a bit of a progress update on one of my whips or maybe a non-progress update on this whip. Uh, this is my sweater number 14 v-neck. It's in the exact same stage as when I had filmed the first podcast. And that is because I had received uh, the yarn and the pattern for the Aspen sweater. And you know when you just really want to savor those thicker gauge, uh, larger needle projects. I just want to spread them out a little bit because um, uh, knitting on a larger needle size can tend to 
uh, hurt my hands, they tend to get a little bit sore just because of the weight of, I think, the, the fabric. So anything knit above, I would say like a 5, 5.5 millimeter knitting needle, I can only handle one of those projects at a time. And also because of the speed, uh, I knit that sweater, the Aspen sweater, in three weeks. Um, and I just like the satisfaction of finishing those thicker or heavier gauge product projects. So this one was put on ice for this month. Um, yeah, really didn't want to knit it too much. And so there's no progress, uh, but just wanted to share. This project is in the exact same state as it was as a month ago. Uh, but that's okay because it's a super simple meditative knit so I'll, I'll always enjoy having it and then hopefully I can pick it up again soon. My second whip is my April cardigan. This one I did make more progress on. I knit the uh, rest of the body and the hem and then the two sleeves as well. But I'm in a little bit of a conundrum so I haven't been able to start the double knit button band. Maybe I'll just get into the details of what I knit so far and then get into my dilemma afterwards. <laughs> so I followed this pattern almost to a T. Um, I think I the only modifications I really made is I knit the body a little bit longer than what the pattern specified, uh, but I followed the sleeve decreases exactly as written in the pattern. Um, but what I did want to talk about was the modification I made to the one by one rib. So I don't know about you, but whenever I knit one by one uh, regular rib uh, flat, the, it always comes out super uneven. And I don't really know what it is. I think maybe it's the way that I'm wrapping the yarn, but the knit stitches always turn out a little bit wonky and I wanted it to have a little bit more of a cleaner finish. So I was trying out a new technique, uh, which is, I'll link it down below, but it's a technique to get your one by one ribbing to look neater. So I think it looks pretty good on the sleeve. And then this is how it looks flat on the body. Pretty good, right? <laughs> or at least I, I think so. Okay, I'm going to try and explain this technique again. I've since filmed this part three times because I keep messing up how you explain it. So in order to knit this technique um, of a neater one by one rib, you first knit uh, one row as a regular knit one per one. Then it varies a little bit when you're working it flat or in the round. When you're knitting in the round for the second row, you slip the knit stitch and then you work a purl stitch and then you continue that for the rest of the round. So you have slip stitches and then regular purl stitches. And then the following row, you just repeat the first row again where you knit one, purl one. So these stitches are a little bit more elongated. Um, I kind of feel like maybe, I, I honestly don't know what the technique is. I kind of thought it was half fisherman's rib, but I think, I think I'm wrong. I haven't worked half fisherman's rib before, so I, I don't know. Um, but you get these elongated knit columns. When you work this technique flat, you do the same thing. So the first row is a regular knit one, purl one, but then when you're on the wrong side row, so the second row, you're slipping the purl stitches, which is the knit stitch on the right side, and then you're working a knit stitch. And then again, you get these super long uh, elongated knit stitches, which I think just look a little bit clean and a lot neater. So I did that for my April cardigan. I finished the sleeves and the body, but I don't know how exactly I'm gonna work the double knit button band. So my dilemma is the modification that I wanted to make to the band of the cardigan. I wanna do a double knit button band. I've knit one in the past for my zipper sweater, but that one was a little bit different because uh, you have to make the band have a little bit of a placket to insert and sew in the zipper once you're finished and I also used non-superwash yarn. With this April cardigan I use Lang Jowl which is a superwash wool and I also use Knitting for Olive Soft Silk Mohair and I'm just a little bit worried that the superwash yarn is going to grow quite a bit after blocking and the double knit button band might restrict that. 
I know it's all kind of relative. Um, you size down one full needle size to knit it just to account for how tall the rows are with each uh, row of the double knitting. So I know that you do that in order to account for the double knit button band growing or being a lot longer than what the actual knitted piece is. But I just, I wanna stretch this sweater quite a bit with blocking. It's, I think the sleeves are good, but I want the body to be less fitted than what it is right now after trying it on. So I want to stretch the, the sweater. I'm just worried that once I put in the double knit button band before blocking, that might limit how much I can really stretch it. So I put a poll on my story on Instagram. I just asked for knitters who have more experience knitting these types of button bands if they think, uh, yes, it will make a difference and I should block it before working the double knit button band or no, it really doesn't matter. And it was super split. I think it was 51% for um, blocking and 49% no, it doesn't make a difference. So I think on this, to be on the safe side, I will just block it. So after this video, I'm going to block this cardigan and then I'll report back on probably on my Instagram stories. I'm going to measure how much it is right now, pre-blocking, post-blocking, uh, knit the button band and then see what happens, take measurements from there. But once I do that, I'll be finished this garment. So hopefully a finished object in my next podcast. My third whip that I wanted to share is my Frankie Genzer, which is a pattern by Sandis Garn in their 2022 fall pattern booklet. And I really surprised myself with this cast on because I'm actually following through and knitting my fall knitting plans. My sweater number 14 v-neck was in my fall knitting plans video. This pattern was also featured in that video. And so I'm a third of the way there with my fall knitting plans. Um, this pattern I wanted to knit uh, for quite a while now. I wanted to knit it last year, but I never got to it. So I wanted to make it a priority uh, this season. And the pattern features two different gauges, which I think is really nice and helpful. So you can pick uh, the stitch counts that will work with your gauge and the yarn that you are using. So the yarn that I'm using is a reclaimed yarn. I knit this before. Uh, I knit with this yarn before. I had made the Stockholm V-neck sweater, which had grown a lot after blocking. And I also used a very uh, more of a lower quality mohair. And so it was really scratchy, um, very itchy. So I frogged that sweater, took out to the, separated the mohair from the uh, merino, and now I'm knitting it again. So did I mention the yarn? <laughs> The yarn is the uh, Camarose Yaku, which is 100% merino wool uh, in this really nice dusty heathered blue shade. I'm holding uh, the just this yarn by itself. I would normally have held it with a mohair, but I'm really trying to not buy any yarn right now. So I'm knitting the smaller gauge in the pattern and just knitting it with one strand of fingering weight wool. And so I think it's working well. I sized down to 3.5 millimeter needles just because I thought that uh, the gauge in the pattern at four millimeter needles was a little bit too gapey. So um, I sized up, so I'm knitting a size medium. And so far, I think if I'm doing the math correctly, it's gonna fit uh, how I want it to. So this pattern is knit top down with a saddle shoulder construction and the saddle shoulder construction is really similar actually to how the April cardigan is constructed. So I was having a little bit of deja vu while knitting it, um, but you cast on along the top neck edge, then you work uh, pretty frequent increases to shape that saddle shoulder um, and provide stitches to the front uh, and the back and also the sleeves. Then you start working a raglan uh, construction where you are increasing for the body and the sleeves. Uh, and then I'm just knitting, knitting, knitting until it's time to separate for the body and sleeves. Um, I Like I said, I was doing some knitting math um, and trying to account for my smaller gauge um, and also my my how I wanted the garment to fit uh, and so I had done a dumb mistake that maybe I'll explain here to try and help 
uh, and make sure other knitters don't do don't do this. <laughs> Um, but what I wanted to do is when I had looked at the um, model photos online, I thought the neck edge was sitting a little bit high. Uh, so there is no short row shaping in this pattern, but you work some, so you cast on stitches and then you're working flat for a little bit and you're working the increases for the saddle shoulder, but also you're casting on stitches to shape the neckline here and then you cast on stitches and then you can join in the round um so it was it looked to me like it was sitting a little bit high for my liking so i was going to try and um work flat a little bit longer so it could theoretically go a little bit lower before joining in the round uh but i'm gonna try and find a photo online of what it ended up looking like and I didn't notice until I was ready to cast on the stitches to join in the round. Because you're increasing for the neckline at the end of every row um, and you're doing it quite frequently, so the way that it looked was it almost increased quite dramatically and then you cast on stitches so it was almost like a square neckline or like a notched neckline and it just I didn't realize it until the end um and so i was like what why why did i do that <laughs> and so i i ended up frogging and then following what the what the pattern said i think this concept could work you just can't increase that frequently so like i said you were increasing along the neck edge at the end of every round each row i think if you wanted to do that you could um make the neck edge a little bit lower. You just can't increase every round. I think what I would do is I would continue the saddle shoulder longer, but I would increase for the neck edge every other row. And then I think it would be a lot more gradual and it will work. So I don't know if anyone else is going to experience this, but I just wanted to mention that because I thought it was like a silly mistake <laughs> and maybe others could, could learn from it. So um, it's, so far, I'm really enjoying this knit and it is kind of my portable project that I take uh, whenever I'm on public transit, uh, whenever I'm waiting like for appointments. So I'm glad to have one of these more um, relaxing and simple projects to have on the rotation. My next whip is one that I feel like is not gonna make a lot of sense when I hold it up. I don't think you're gonna be able to tell what it is. <laughs> Um, but it is hopefully first of many uh, one of my knitted ornaments that I'm going to make to decorate my Christmas tree so I don't know if you can tell what it is but this is the Little London double decker bus which is a pattern by Amanda Berry and so I'm knitting this because I got a Christmas tree for my apartment uh, and we have one ornament right now <laughs> but I thought maybe I could knit some ornaments because I was doing some research on Ravelry and there are a ton of knitting patterns and a ton of free knitting patterns as well so like I said I was doing that research and that's going to actually be my next video that I'm going to share with you all is um, some knitting inspiration and free knitting patterns if you want to knit for a festive holiday season. Uh, so I thought that maybe I should test out some of the patterns that I'm going to include in that video and just have some samples to show. So this is the first one. Um, it's almost done, I would say. I'm ready to cast off. I just want to try and see if I can kitchener stitch this top edge closed. So that's all that there really is to go on this one. And I'm using all of my yarn scraps for this little knitting adventure. <laughs> um, this yarn was actually the yarn from my camisole number nine. So I had quite a bit of the knitting for olive merino left over. This is from my October sweater. This is from my legs pullover. So leftovers um, are really gonna be coming in handy for these projects. So I pulled out all of them a few days ago and I sorted through them and I have a plan of action for all my knitted ornaments. So stay tuned, that's gonna be in my next video and I'll share more of them in my next knitting podcast as well, the finished ones, I mean. Actually, before I jump to the next uh, part of the podcast, I'll just maybe mention how this 
ornament is constructed. I think knitting ornaments is really going to improve my skills with uh, color work, knitting small circumferences in the round, knitting with double pointed needles. Um, so I'm really excited to start knitting a lot of them. I thought this one was a good one to start with because it's quite simple, I think, in construction. So this is the size of the ornament, but it's actually knit uh, flat like this. So um, you cast on stitches and then the pattern specifies when to change colors each row. And then once you're done, you end up folding the uh, piece in half and then you graph the top. Then you do some embroidery to actually make this look like a bus. So you sew along where the white is to kind of make it look like windows. And then you also sew little buttons here to make the wheels. Then when you're done, you graph the side closed, then you stuff the ornament, and then after that you graph the bottom closed. So, um, Almost there, I would say I'm about half done. I feel like the rest of those techniques are what's gonna take a long time just to get the motivation to sit down and, and do it. But I'm really excited. Um, I went to London uh, four years ago now and I just fell in love with, with the city and I just loved it. So I thought this was a really fun reminder of it and I'm excited to have this as my first ornament. So this next section of the podcast is a new edition. I'm going to be calling it my plans. So I'm going to be speaking about my next cast on. So they're not technically whips yet, but I'm going to be casting them on shortly after filming this podcast. Uh, and I am wanting to create this section mainly for myself because I am a pretty indecisive person. So for me, it would be really helpful to share what I'm planning to cast on next, uh, kind of work through some details, see if anyone can give me any advice um, with, like in this case, it's going to be color choices and techniques, but also if anyone has knit the piece before and can offer any early uh, advice. So I mentioned in my last podcast that I wanted to do a color block simple stockinette knitted wrap. And so what I did is what I think many people do when they want some fashion inspo is I went on Pinterest and I searched up color block scarves. And what I was seeing was, I think a lot of them or probably all of them are machine knit and or woven. And so they had some nice subtle um, transition between the, the color blocks. Uh, so that was one thing that I was really inspired by. And the second was um, some of them had tassels along the edge. So this is what led to my indecisiveness. Uh, and so I have two options that I wanted to share with you all and maybe um, no pressure, but if you do have an opinion, um, just feel free to leave down below which of the two options you would go with. And then hopefully I can read all of those uh, suggestions and then decide and cast on. So maybe I'll just give a bit of a refresher of the colors that I um, am going to be using and um, my, my plants. So I have a bright tomato red, a chartreuse green, I would call it like a dusty turquoise, a light beige, light pink, and a cream color. So I have two balls of each shade, so quite a generous meterage to create the color block. And what I wanna do is I wanna knit um, all of the yarn that I have in each color before doing that transition to the next color. Option A is, I made tiny swatches as well to, to show. Um, option A is this. So I will knit one color and then I'll do three rounds of one by one alternating color work. I think it looks really fun, playful, um, and it just transitions well to the next color. So that's option one, is to do this one by one alternating color work between all six color blocks. And option two is when I was really inspired by the tassels. So I wasn't too keen on doing the tassels in all six colors, so I decided to use the most neutral shade of the six, so the cream. 
and I still wanted to do a bit of a transition between the two but I kind of wanted to knit columns to tie into the tassels. So option two is to do also a color work. It's six rows of one by one color work with color A and then color B. So what I did for this is I did three rounds of one by one color work with the pink and the cream and I switched to three rounds of one by one color work with the blue and the cream or the turquoise and the cream. I think it looks really cool and it ties in really well with the with the tassels. So um, I'm gonna make the tassels the same length or at least try to in the actual scarf but uh, I looked up a tutorial online, so I was just trying out different techniques of how to do this twisted tassel. So um, I think it looks really nice and I'm leaning towards option two because I really like the look of these tassels. I also met up with some knitting friends and I shared both swatches and they also uh, went with the second option. So don't let that sway you if you, you liked option one. Uh, just let me know down below and then hopefully I can come to a decision. So a recap of the options again. Option one is to do um, color block with all six colors and do an alternating uh, color work as a transition between the two colors. And then option two is to do a color block with five of the colors and then do some color work with the white in between all the colors and then some tassels at the end of the wrap. And now on to my acquisitions. Someone had left a very helpful comment in my first knitting podcast saying that for my acquisitions, it would be a really fun idea to also uh, pull out some yarn from my stash and maybe share a little bit about the yarn qualities and what I want to make with it which I think is a really great idea and I that got me thinking a lot about what I wanted this section to look like. So I wouldn't say that I'm on a yarn ban necessarily but I'm just trying to limit the amount of yarn that I'm purchasing and bringing into my yarn stash and my collection. So with this acquisition section it, it will end up being mostly uh, yarn that's been gifted to me or that I receive for test knits or maybe some collaborations. And so I don't know, I don't know how I fully feel about, I guess, sharing that. Like I do really want to share my appreciation for the yarn. And a lot of the time the yarn is um, gifts from friends and family from other countries. And so I still really want to talk about that because I find it really interesting and, and fun, but I don't know, um, yeah, if people really want to see that, <laughs> but I figured I'm still trying to figure out what I want this segment to be. So I'm just going to keep the format the same for now as my first podcast and just share my acquisitions, the new yarn that I have. And I figured if people aren't interested, they can just skip. And I also will keep it at the end of the video. So uh, with all that being said, I will get into the acquisition. My acquisition this month was a gift from my boyfriend's parents. I know they watched my last two videos. I don't know if they're watching this one, but if they are, thank you again, Grace and Alberto. Uh, but they got me some yarn on their most recent trip to Germany. Uh, and I know they had watched my podcast because they told me that they went to a few yarn shops in Germany trying to find something for me, which that's so sweet. And I, um, I'm so uh, happy and thankful that they were willing to do that, but they just were a little bit overwhelmed. And so they watched the first podcast where I had said that I really like getting yarn that is local to that country or that place that they're visiting. Uh, and I, I like merino wool. And so they got me yarn from Schaffel, which is local to Germany. And when I had first seen this logo, it looked so familiar to me, but I couldn't put my finger on, on why. And then when I had searched up uh, the company afterwards, when I went home, I realized that I had seen this yarn because I think they're also the creators of the Zauber Ball, which is this really fun, eclectic, uh, self-striping sock yarn. I think I saw it when I went to a Spash Tricot and it's um, this one ball of yarn that has all these funky colors and a fun transition between the two. It was, they're really cool. Um, so I, I had knew about this company from that yarn. I had never seen this yarn though before. I don't think they sell it in 
any of the shops that I've been to in Toronto or in the general area that I am in. So it's very special and I'm very thankful for that. It is their Bio Marinos, which is 150 grams for every 50 meters and it's 95% uh, virgin wool and 5% linen. Really cool. I've never seen yarn in that type of exact composition before, so I'm excited to try it out. And they got it for me in this light gray, but it also has some heathering and flecks of black in it. And they got me six balls of it. So in total, I have 900 meters to, to create something. Uh, I want to keep it in my stash for some time so I can admire it and really think of the perfect project for it. But I don't know why, whenever I'm looking at this yarn, I just am envisioning it becoming some sort of wrap, like a wrap cardigan or, um, I don't know, like a Clemetta sweater. I just really think that this yarn is, is destined for that. So um, I've been doing some searching on, on Ravelry and hopefully I'll find a project for it soon. And so with that, that wraps up my second knitting podcast. Thank you if you're still here. I think this is gonna be a long one. <laughs> I don't know exactly when I started recording, but it just seems like it's gonna be a long episode. Um, and just wanted to say thank you again to everybody who has stuck around and subscribed. I'm so thankful and so happy um, to be starting on this channel. And don't forget to leave down below which option, option A or option B, that would be really helpful and much appreciated. Okay, I'm gonna say bye and until the next video.